Hello and welcome to Good Evening Britain, a Force for Goods weekly show coming to you live from our studios here in the heart of the great British city of Glasgow with me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. We're broadcasting on all our digital platforms throughout the United Kingdom and across the world, bringing you quality pro-UK comment and analysis every Wednesday from 7 until 8 p.m. on Facebook and on YouTube and on Twitter and on TikTok. Folks, please do send in your comments, please send in your questions, and we'll do our best to answer them. Now, we have a great guest on tonight at 7.30. It's the one and only Emperor David Clues, as he jokingly styles himself. We're talking, of course, about David Clues from Unity News Network, UNN. And David is a good friend of the show, and we're a good friend of his. And he's always got a lot of interesting and clever and insightful things to say. So please do hold on for David at 7.30 at the bottom of the hour. And just before the bottom of the hour as well, we'll have our competition. And next month is going to be Remembrance Month. And so one of the prizes that we've got tonight is this little Remembrance Badge, which is a soldier there. And it says, never forget, all gave some and some gave all. And that's the prize tonight, along with a free copy of our latest magazine, King and Country, which in itself is worth £4.50 to the discerning reader. So folks, please do watch the show and enjoy the show and tell us what is on your mind tonight. Now, we are, of course, as always, teleprompter free. OK, this isn't scripted. So we go where the spirit takes us, and we do hope that that approach is appreciated by all the viewers, the viewers that like us, and some of the viewers that don't like the idea of keeping the United Kingdom together. Think about that. What a terrible position to adopt, wanting to break up the greatest country in the world. And... You know what? If you've got an opinion on that, please, please do tell us. Please do tell us. And um, I'm just looking at a message here. There we go. Now, somebody says on TikTok that independence is coming. Well, no, sir. Unity is coming. That's what's coming. Unity is coming. The... All the British people from Scotland, England, Northern Ireland and Wales understanding that our best interests, as always, are served as part of one big country. And I mention that one big country because that's our phrase that we came up with. We love our one big country. And in fact, we released an article on our Substack this week saying that. Now, we'll put up the Substack address if we have it here and... You can go there and you can read our articles, which are free, which are free for the first two weeks. And then they go behind our paywall. And our paywall is, uh, we don't have it. We don't have it lined up. Can you believe that? Anyway, our paywall um, requires people to pay to get to read it. But you can get behind our paywall by simply becoming a monthly donor. And through the normal mechanism, which is our union supporters program at a forceforgood.uk forward slash union hyphen supporters. And one of the benefits of that is becoming a becoming a uh, a sub sub stack follower at the same time and reading our words of wisdom that are on there. Now. David Clues coming up at the bottom of the hour. Looking forward to that, folks. Now, let's say hello to a few people who have come in this evening. Adam, who was first in? Who was first in? Debbie was first in. Good to see Debbie. And all us unionists in the house. And Melissa, hey, 
to you also. Hope you're having a nice night. And to Adam, hello to Adam and to TC. Good evening, all fellow unionists everywhere, says TC and Stuart from Windy Elgin. Derek from Armadale. Adam there with his message saying that Hamza Yusuf was made to apologise three times in last week's First Minister's questions after accusing Douglas Ross of lying. And did he ever get round to apologising? Did, did, he, did he do it on the fourth time? Or was it the third time? Um, and TC says, Our wonderful union will stand the test of time. The union of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland will never fall. That's right, we will never fall. And as Stephen says, when people say independence is so-called inevitable, it makes it more important to keep the pressure up and hold the Greens and SNP to account. A uh, gentleman there on TikTok says, the unionists can't help but to, what was that? But to bend the knee to the foreigners in the South. <laughs> Well, you see, that's the difference between uh, unionists and some of the so-called nationalists. They see the English as foreigners, where in fact we see them as part of our family. Very often, quite literally as well, part of our one big family. As we like to say, we're not so much a family of nations as we are a nation of families. How profound, how profound. I came up with that. And it still deserves to get proper uh, publicity, that one. Absolutely. We're not so much a family of nations as a nation of families. Quite literally. Quite literally. Christopher says, a cold wind is blowing through narrow Scottish nationalism. A chilling wind often, it has to be said, but certainly a wind, sometimes a chilly one, sometimes just hot air. Alan can't watch it all tonight because he's working, but he'll catch up on YouTube. Fantastic. Stephen says, how do we feel that the chain of freedom is going to go for the nationalists? Will it, will it be measured in miles or yards? Folks, just to back up, what this is about is this Saturday, the 14th, the, um, the, the a wing of Scottish nationalists, let's just call them to be kind to them, let's call them the crank wing, have decided that they're going to get as many people as possible to stand in a line, linking hands, and hopefully the line is going to stretch from somewhere in Glasgow to all the way through to the Scottish Parliament, which is like 77 miles or something like that. Well, of course, as we know, they're not going to get that because that would require tens of thousands of people. And it would, of course, hold up the entire central belt, clog up the entire uh, motorways and roads and transport systems and probably even the air to try to get that happening. But of course, uh, they're not going to happen they're not going to get that. They'll be quite lucky if they get enough people to link arms out of the car park in Deniston or wherever they are beginning it. And I'm not joking when I say that. Um, when they first came up with a cranky plan, it was meant to be along the Union, the, the canals, one of which is called the Union Canal, obviously. And so what they, uh, they contacted the Union Canal of authorities and they said not on our Nelly or even your Nelly uh, because it's too dangerous because people will fall into the into the canal in their excitement of joining hands they are going to fall into the canal and uh, so they prohibited the Union Canal pro authorities prohibited the Nats from standing along that particular line which was just as well because it meant they had to find 44,000 less people I think it was or something like that may as well be that number so I predict they are going to get maybe uh, overall they might get two or three hundred scattered about at different points, standing about going, well, what do we do now? Let's link hands and hopefully we, Jimmy, can take a photograph of us. 
But, you know, my heart kind of goes out to them because obviously they're so sincere in this that I don't really like taking the mick from them. But you can't help it, can you? Because it's, it's uh, kind of Scottish nationalists, just you, they, they have that effect upon you. So how do I think it's going to go? It's not going to go well for them. Let, let's hope that they stay safe and that they stay out of the canal because that would be a tragedy if anybody fell in. Um, TC says, wise, wise words. That would be your nation of families. Was it Shakespeare or was it Alistair Burns? I think it was the former. <laughs> The only thing that are clogged are nationalist brains. Doug, then there'll be dogs everywhere, that's for sure. And good to see Cat in the house. So, um, David Clues coming up at the bottom of the hour. Before I do that, I've been doing some research this week and I just wanted to tell you about it. I'm going to take this into an article, hopefully tomorrow or Friday, and it'll go up free for two weeks on our Substack. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at all the elections that have occurred that have occurred in the um, in Scotland since the Scottish nationalists took power in 2007 and let me just check my figures here because believe it or not right there has been there has been um, eight elections in the 16 years of nationalist power in Scotland since they took power in 2007. And four of those were at Holyrood and four of those were at Westminster. And of course, we've also had two nationwide referendums, the UK membership referendum and the Brexit referendum. Note that I said UK membership referendum. I didn't say the independence referendum. I framed it. See what I did there? I framed it uh, to our side. The UK membership referendum in 2014 and the Brexit referendum. So let's... The Scottish nationalists are going to go in to... And I'm talking about the SNP here. They're going to go into the 2024 general election and they're going to try to get a mandate. Now, a mandate... A proper mandate would have to be over 50% of the entire electorate. Okay, so what we can do in order to gauge the likelihood of that is to look at the percentages that they've achieved in those eight elections. What percentage of the overall Scottish electorate has the SNP managed to achieve in these eight elections since 2007. And that will give us some idea the extent to which they can get a genuine mandate, which would have to be at least over 50% of the entire electorate. Now, remember that most of the electorate often doesn't bother to vote. And at Scottish elections, the turnout tends to be dismal. So a very interesting intellectual exercise, which can also give you good fodder for the conversation around the pub. So we decided to come up with that. It's going to appear, this chapter will appear in our next book, which we are going to be bringing out, God willing, if we get the funding for that before Christmas. So let's just briefly run through that. Now we can go back to the... And the franchise for the Scottish elections and the UK elections are slightly different. More people can vote at Scottish elections than at the British general election. But we, we mentioned that in the article. But for now, at the Holyrood election in 2007, the SNP vote as a percentage of the entire Scottish electorate was 16.6. Okay, 17% of the entire Scottish electorate. That's what put Alex Salmond into power in 2007 and that was what give, gave them the kick start from which we're all still suffering. 17% of the entire Scottish electorate. That was put, what put Alex Salmond in power in 2007. 
OK, so let's fast forward to 2011, the next one. The SNP vote expressed as a percentage of the entire electorate was 225 Still very low, not even a quarter. Then the next Scottish election at Holyrood in 2016, the SNP vote expressed as a percentage of the entire electorate was 246 Let's call it 25% to be generous. So a quarter of the entire electorate. Still considerably away from 50% or more. And then the most recent one, most recent Holyrood election, in 2021, the SNP vote expressed as a percentage of the entire electorate was 27.9%. Slightly higher, again, but still not even 30%, and still not even one third of the entire electorate. So th those were the four Holyrood elections that we've had since 2007, since the Nationalists took power. Let's look at the Westminster elections. The first one was in 2010. The SNP vote expressed as a percentage of the total electorate was 12.7%. 12.7%. In 2015, at the general election, the SNP vote expressed as a percentage of the total electorate was considerably higher. 35.5%. There was a problem in 2010 regarding a large number of votes which were uncounted because of electronic machines. I don't know if you'll remember that debacle. Anyway, we include that information in the article. Then the Westminster 2017 general election, the SNP vote expressed as a percentage of the total electorate was down to 24.5. Let's call it a quarter of the electorate. And then the last Westminster election in 2019, the SNP vote expressed as a percentage of the total electorate was 30.7%. Okay, 30.7%, which is still less than a third of the total eligible electorate. So the SNP are way away from getting what would be a considered, at the very least, a proper mandate, which would be at least 50% plus one of the entire electorate. We'll be bringing out those figures. We'll be showing you how we calculated them in our next article on our Substack, which you can find at ukaforceforgood.substack.com. Now, in 12 minutes, we have got our man, David Close, who is going to be our guest. And we're going to be talking about what's going on in the world at the moment. But um, first, our On This Day in British History. And folks, afterwards, I will ask you a question about what happened on this day. And the first person to send their answer to contact at a force for good uk the first person to send their answer to that is in with the chance of winning will win so if you haven't done this before please do it please do it please send an email to contact at a force for good uk and you might be in with the chance of winning this and you will also get a free copy of our magazine king and country more about that in a minute So, what happened on this day in British history? Well, on this day in British history, the 11th of October in 1982, one of Henry VIII's ships of the Navy was raised from the Solent. Now, the Solent is that strip of water between the Isle of Wight and Portsmouth. And back in 1545, there had been the Battle of the Solent, a naval battle between the forces then of Henry VIII and the French. And a ship called the Mary Rose was firing its guns 
at the French and it exhausted all the guns on one side and it turned round to bring the guns to bear on the other side and as it turned round a gust of wind caught it at a bad angle and historians believe that water rushed into the open gun portholes and ended up capsizing the entire thing all over and it sunk straight to the bottom of the Solent where it lay for 437 years until this day in 1982. So we've got a picture of the Mary Rose. Let's fire that one up. That's what the Mary Rose looked like. So it was when she turned round, she made a, a an error. And historians say it was probably because she may have been overweight and sitting too far in the water in the first place. So when she turned round, when she listed over, all the water went into the gun portholes and capsized it. And Wikipedia says there was um, around... There was uh, 400 and uh, over 400 men on board. Now, let's have our next picture of the Mary Rose up here. That is the Mary Rose being lifted. So you can see it's not exactly lifted in its entirety, but that's the, the, the most of one side of it. And that was on this day, okay. And... They took it to the Mary Rose Museum, which is in Portsmouth. I don't know if any of you have been there and preserved that ship there. And to be frank with you, it doesn't look that big from those pictures. And I don't know how you'd cram 430 men in there. And as we, as we know from history, these figures have tended to be estimated or often exaggerated in conflict. But anyway, there was an awful lot of men in there and they, they drowned. Okay. So there's another picture of the side of the Mary Rose. So if you're in Portsmouth, check check that out. That was on this day the Mary Rose was raised from the watery depths of the Solent. We'll ask you a question about that in a moment for this prize, this Remembrance Day badge. And folks, please... If you haven't done it before, send your answer to contact at aforceforgood.uk and you will be in with a chance of winning it. Now, and you'll also be getting this magazine. Now, I'm going to introduce our guest in about seven minutes and it's David Clues from Unity News Network. And see that phrase there, king and country. I was looking at that today. And I really like that phrase because it sums up, it sums up um, m many things in there. Uh, many things are summed up in that phrase, uh, which you don't need to be talking about, for example, uh, your values or what you think your rights are or anything like that. So there's phrases that can just conjure up immediately what you're trying to say and what you, in fact, believe in. And king and country is one of those phrases. And I noticed a letter in the Daily Telegraph back in September where a guy was making this kind of point. And he was saying that some people think that, for example, in World War Two or World War One, that men went off to fight for enlightenment values of, of reason and liberal values. And he writes here that more recently, our warriors on land, sea and air fought for traditional values, the defense of Christian civilization. Roosevelt appealed to Christian democracy. Thousands of letters from ordinary soldiers talk of king and country. Home and Uncle Sam, not liberal constructs. Enlightenment values, he says, offer no basis for loyalty. In fact, modern wokery shares the same corrupted rationalist source. Both derive from alleged universal principles instead of experience. And I was reminded of a phrase that I heard David Clues come up with 
a um, couple of uh, weeks ago on one of his shows, and he talked about faith, family, and flag. And I really liked that phrase, and I wrote it down, and I thought, I thought quite a bit about that, and I thought how in those terms, faith, family, and flag. And I'll ask David Clues to expand upon this when when we speak to him about how what's embodied in those things and how you can cleave to these values without really having to um, explain too deeply, because you just there's something in you that just knows what that's about it's like eternal values rather than being buffeted by the day-to-day politics and my goodness me we're seeing some of that in the last uh, few days not really knowing where to stand not really knowing what's going on not knowing knowing if what's true and what's false and so on but trying to hold true to things like faith and family and and flag and trying to do what's best to the extent that you can understand these things and i wrote about this in king and country here when i when i talked about the role of the monarch and i said in an ever-changing nation and world people are looking for symbols icons of enduring identity and reassuring dignity people are looking for constancy for something which is faithful and remains and is always here. In this way, the monarchy is a social unifier and provides a social stability which a temporary politician cannot. Which is a is a good way of talking about it because people will say, well, how can you like the king because he's got all these ridiculous notions and globalist notions about gibberish, globalist gibberish. And it's like, yeah, well, maybe he does, but he is the king and he's part of that eternal institution of um in this case the flag the monarchy is embodied within that phrase the flag it's one of these eternal institutions and and we who cleave to the eternal rather than the temporary passing are people who can also have loyalty to those institutions even though we know often some of the people in these institutions might not necessarily be uh, correct in some of the things that they say. That doesn't mean that we toss the baby out with the bathwater. And we'll, we'll, we'll develop that conversation when we speak to David, who is coming up in a couple of minutes. But before we speak to David, let me ask you the question for today's prize, which is this little flag, Remembrance Day lest we forget because next month is Remembrance Day and while we are not pro-war and while we look back on the wars with with often shock and unhappiness we do of course remember those who gave their lives for what they believed in and what they thought they were fighting for the ideals that they believed in so we always pay them proper respect doesn't mean that we're pro war per se because that's something to be avoided at all costs now so the question and it is related to a war it's related to the battle of the solent back in 15 back in um, the 16th century henry the eighth lost one of his ships when it turned turtle and capsized what was the name of the ship that was raised back up or at least partially raised back up on this day back in 1982 okay send your answer to contact at a force for good dot uk Good, good. Folks, David Clues, I'm just about to bring in. Now, he is the organiser and the founder of Unity News Network. Some of you know him before. I'm sure he'll give us a brief introduction. To those who don't know him, please do listen carefully to what he says. David is a great worker, he's a great unionist, and he is a great man. So let's bring him on right now. David, how are you? How are you? Are you all right? 
I am. I'm. I'm okay, David. Thank you very much for agreeing to appear on the show. Now, folks, if you're on TikTok, you won't see this, but you fly over to Twitter or YouTube at UK A Force for Good, and you'll find us there. So, David, I don't know if you heard some of the stuff that I was talking about there. Yeah. Um. Yep. I, I do. I do I want listening. to thank you. I do want to thank you for your phrase that I just hadn't heard randomly one night. I was watching you on D Live. We'll put up your your D Live address, and you were talking about uh, just what we can believe in, and and you came up with that phrase, which obviously uh, you've heard other people say. But I just thought it, that's a good way of actually summarizing stuff. You know, faith. Um. Well, that was Family really was, and flag. That that was really what this country was was built on, and um, it's it's funny. I was it, when you actually stop and think of where where we are now as a nation. You know, I was I, I'm pretty similar to you, Alistair. I think you're a, a wee bit older than me. Um, brought up, you know, at my formative years were sort of the late eighties, early nineties. This was still. <laughs> A proper country you know i'm not saying we're not now but we really were you know the the, the still the, the 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 remembering of the victory of world war ii um you had the falklands conflict you still had a very powerful british army um <laughs> that's very kind comments there um and it 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 really is to just where we are in the last sort of 30 years, the sort of both moral and societal collapse where we have just this, this nothingness in the United Kingdom, because the, you, you know, the, the UK was a unique nation on this planet. The industrial revolution was born in this country. And nearly everything you see around the world is a result of what happened here between probably the, 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 maybe 1750 to 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 1900 um and is is you know really forgotten that and and it it just it it really it grates with me you know all this stuff like when i mean i'm not going to get too political on that side of it but you know diversity built britain or where would we be without this you know this you know, you know was it pax britannica when when britain really was a the global superpower from the in the end of the Napoleonic age, probably up until about what so about about a hundred years, Britain, the United Kingdom, was a superpower, e- even more powerful than the U.S. Um, is now. I mean, the U.S. is a a global superpower, but it didn't have the land and the territory. And I was talking about this with my colleague Anthony Weber last night. Countries wanted to be governed by the British. When the Ottoman Empire collapsed, the British took over the mandate of Palestine because they, we were trusted to run it fairly, not support one other or other side, and actually try and have a peaceful state. I mean, that, that's again, we're just, again, you, all colonialism bad, this evil country that, that don't, you know, a lot of people actually like their life. Their lives improved, their literacy levels improved, their educational levels improved. So, you know, people were very scared of 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 talking about the British Empire and, and talking about it. But you know, the UK really was a a unique nation in, in in history. And I'm sure I've said this before. It kind of breaks the heart to see what's happened to it. But we are where we are. Oh, absolutely. And uh, you mentioned Pax Britannica. That's Latin for British peace. <laughs> and the British did enforce, as it were, peace around the territories that we were in control of. Correct. And unlike today's American empire, and it most certainly nope. is an empire, <laughs> we, we, uh, we were organic, like we were in there uh, with people running things and uh, doing, making schools and hospitals and uh, employing people and businesses and so on. The, the American empire, such as, as it exists, is really just held together by, by uh, force and bombs, unfortunately, Correct. and we're, we're, we're seeing that today. It's just like a brute force. Everything's just become like brutalized. And um, to get to... Uh, in, in, in that particular regard as well, it's it's shocking the extent to which people have lost uh, the faith, as it were. Now, I mean, I know Christianity, for example, is sometimes uh, uh, often can be, can be used to by people who are not really Christians 
but um, there was, in the British Empire, there was certainly was a true belief that what we're doing here is we're trying to spread the idea of Christianity. So there was a kind of governing a mm-hmm. governing ideology. You know, the ideology wasn't as the letter writer there that I, that I quoted from from uh, the Daily Telegraph. It wasn't, oh, we're spreading liberal values of, you know, <laughs> yeah. whatever those are today. Um, we're, we're trying to spread this eternal message of peace Correct. and goodwill and brotherhood among all men. Um, which uh, and and the, is, the, 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 the mm. pe- people really, I mean, what people need to understand is there has been a cultural Marxist revolution in the last 20 years now the, uh, well there's not been any visual signs of that there's not been any statues pulled down well actually there has been a few statues pulled down oh well, there hasn't been any streets renamed well actually there has been a few streets renamed but it's it's not been a revolution in the sense that you know people think they watched it on Les Miserables where you know they go in and, and storm the the Bastille but they they they, they they, they now look at World War I, World War II through this ideological prism. Um, that, you know, when, when, they, when these men were storming the D-Day, they were, they were there to, to fight against fascism. I mean, that's not strictly true, you know, because they were there to fight for Britain, for the empire, for Christianity, and, 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 and as a, a land battle. And, you know, it's just, it, it, it's so frustrating. Oh, oh yeah well, well my uh, my paternal grandfather was a captain in the Royal Marines during World mm-hmm. War two and I mean he couldn't have told you anything about politics he didn't yes. know anything he certainly could, he'd, he would have trouble spelling like what what is even fascism he wouldn't even have heard of the concept all he was there for was king and country it, he felt yes. it was his duty to do it and that was and that was especially among basically everybody who was who was fighting and and during World War One as well. And uh, my paternal family are from the Dune Valley. And mm-hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, my father and mother took us to see a war memorial up in the Dune Valley, just above Dom Ellington. And you know the numbers of men from that area who who were as poor as get out i mean they, they were just working in the mines and they but they just felt this compulsion to fight for king and country and they didn't they themselves had uh, had nothing to gain from it and everything to lose and some of them of course lost everything in that sense but they couldn't have they, they weren't doing it for any uh, enlightenment values or anything like that it was oh, just, of course just of course just the, the the king and country well that was that was that was that was what you were to do you know that's uh, yeah. um yeah. And 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 that was there was a there was a a simplicity about about things back then and and um the, you you fought oh. for your country. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and these wars um, did eventually end up brutalizing. I think the the human spirit in a terrible way that 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 is almost reaching an apogee today because you know as far as what's going on in the Middle East is concerned, obviously a force for goods not going to take sides on that particular matter but it looks like you have to you know and if you don't then you're somehow supporting one side over the other it's just it, it's just, you know what it's just so chi it's just i find that whole thing so childish alistair it really is oh if you don't stand with us you stand with the terrorists now that's not really how the world works. was was switzerland in world war ii were they really nazis because you know it's just mm. so stupid like yeah. there is there is a concept yeah. which is known as neutrality and what's interesting about this conflict in the the middle east that's erupted is the way in which um people are just taking a side because that like for example hamza yusuf's come out he's pushing that peoples who are unionists or pro uk's initial instinct is well i'm i'm gonna go and fight i'm gonna stand side with the israelis on this now the the reality is this conflict has nothing to do with us at, at, at all. I mean, it just doesn't. There's war all the time around the world. There was there was war. There's war in Africa all the time. There's an ongoing war in Yemen, which is brutal. And the the reason and the the, the this war does matter to us is you have a substantial Muslim population 
in this country, and you also have a large Jewish population in this country who exert influence in politics, in, in the media, etc. And that's just a reality about it. Therefore, it kind of becomes our war as well. Now, everyone everyone should be able to have an opinion and have a discussion about it and, and have free speech and the ability to discuss it. But my argument is, is look, please don't get bullied into taking a side um, because <laughs> it, it's, it's, there's no need to do that. And this mm. is, you were bullied during COVID that you had to take a side. You were bullied during the Ukraine war that you had to take a side. And right now you're being bullied by mass propaganda campaigns on both sides. But the majority of the Western MSM is taking a, a, a very pro-Israel stance and pushing like just fake news to elicit an emotional response in people. And people need to be aware that this is happening and just to calm down is my advice. Um, well, I think that's good advice. And to take a, a deep breath and step back and 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 uh, not get into a situation where you find yourself promoting uh, war propaganda for one side or the right. other because war propaganda is intended to get you to hate and to kill your fellow human beings which no and one it's, no it's, one no, no, no one should do you know no, that I, I i i am absolutely appalled alistair at the behavior of some people because when these things happen we we do we do not share these things looking for social media clicks and the amount of the amount of and I, I don't like using this term because it's overused, but real literal fake news mm. thing videos completely. I mean, Donald Trump Jr. shared a video, and it was of a massacre in Syria from 2015. Yeah, I and know. We 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 we're always getting the BBC's always bombarding people with fact checks and the importance. Whereas here, I mean, it's just it is there is just bombardments of it. And as I said, it's. It's going on on both sides. But then, again, is it because people in the West have never fought in a war? They don't know the reality of it? That, well, I'm just sharing something on Twitter. Do they not realize that, <laughs> you know, this? there's bombs dropping in Gaza? There's there's killers. There's terrorists on the run in Israel shooting people. I, do you know what? This is serious. I think people are just, they, they, because they're so decent. It's like they say in the military, these people that just fly drones. You know, once upon a time you were going out and you were putting a bayonet into someone. Now you're just flying a joystick and just pressing a button. You don't really have a sense of what you're. You don't smell it. You're not on the ground. You don't. You don't see it, and it's it's dreadful. It, it, oh, absolutely! And modern entertainment is making that considerably worse because these video games. And I don't play video games, but I know people who do. Not only are they addictive, but they're incredibly realistic. And your brain cannot tell the difference mm -hmm. between something that happens to you in real life and something that you watch. And I've always known that. And when I was growing up, there would be, in the 70s, there was like a violent films. And you'd read these articles, people saying, it's only a film, it doesn't affect you. And I'm like, well, it does affect me for a start. I saw that guy who's the lead actor and I want to copy his hairstyle, right? So straight away that's <laughs> affected me. So are you telling me, how can films not affect me? Mm -hmm. You know, so... You knew that was a lie, that films do affect you. And now as I've grown older and wiser, I've realized that in fact films are used uh, mainly for political reasons in order to move society certain ways because of course they do affect you and they affect society. And with the, the, the realism as well and the unnecessary brutality in a lot of films these days and on Netflix, which is kind of uh, less policed by the authorities as it were than Britain growing up in 1970 for um it's uh it's, there's just unnecessary brutality well, it's, and it's people war it's, that it's, and it's, it's 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 war porn that's what war, it basically war porn, is yeah. it's war yeah. war pornography and yeah. yeah it's 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 and again it's it's all it's what, what i don't like about this society now is it's so emotional now again what this country prided itself on was having a, st a stiff upper lip mm. that that people didn't behave like <laughs> mediterranean types we didn't burst into tears and you, you know we yes. we had we had a different way of doing things exactly exactly and, and 
but and there was a, a calmness about it. Exactly. Abroad was where everybody was always <laughs> shouting. <laughs> That's what it mm-hmm. looked like on the news mm-hmm. reports. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you're like, why are mm-hmm. all these people always shouting? Why can't they just be sensible? <laughs> and and, and the, the, the other thing is as well, I say, and people don't like to hear this because, again, people have been so brainwashed by the, the propaganda. Christianity is a very different faith than Judaism and Islam. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's completely different. Whereas you've had this, again, cultural marks as well. You know, we all worship the same God and we're all, go- we're all from it. That's not, that is not true. If you're a Christian, mm. you believe that Jesus was was God incarnate, crucified, dead and buried and rose. And through faith in him, you attain salvation. That yes. is very different from Islam and Judaism, which are much more legalistic based. They are much more ritualistically based as well. Now, I'm not denigrating these faiths. I'm not attacking them. I'm just saying if they're very different. And Christianity has a, has a far greater place for morality and, and, and also the concept of sin and the mm. concept of, 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 of actions and, and belief systems. So that, that's, and again, that's why if you go to a Muslim country, it's a Muslim country. If you go to a Christian country, it's a Christian country. They are, they are, there are differences, but, and, and everyone else gets that in the world. Every yes. other, but obviously the West people just, well, we're all, we're all just, we're just individuals as part of a, you know, getting on with our consumerist lifestyle and doing what we need to do to be able to, to, to do things. That's just it's nonsense. That, that's right. And some of the so-called Christians, you're absolutely right. True Christianity is about that. It's about uh, actually loving your enemies. Yes. It's not about killing your enemies. Correct. Uh, in, Dist- in, blo- in bloodlust. D- 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 and and that, 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 the thing, and I've seen it on, this is the thing people aren't acknowledging. Both sides, the, the, the gallant, we're going to open the gates of hell. We're going to, we're going to, I mean, just really like Old Testament style talk. And the reason it's Old Testament is because Judaism is based on the Torah. And yeah. then, of course, you've got the Talmud, the Zohar as well, where it's Christianity, as you say, love thy neighbor. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And now, that's not to say that I'm a pacifist. There is such a thing as defending yourself in, in, in a just war, but. The, the, the people need to realize that that there are there are differences the way we yeah. do things are different Ab- absolutely i just want to word on on tiktok folks we're actually interviewing somebody here that you won't see on tiktok unless you go to our youtube channel which is youtube.com forward slash uk a force for good that's why you're not hearing any sound when i'm not speaking because it's we can't get a live interview here on tiktok but we'll be back uh shortly but you're absolutely right about that david and um a lot of the accounts as well that are on Twitter, especially that are MAGA accounts that claim to be Christian, Terrible. they are clearly not Christian or no, there's some strange no, kind of Christianity no. because they're they're advocating literally leveling uh, uh-huh. parts, I, I, of, I, parts of the Christian Holy Land because oh, uh, you know people talk about the Holy Land oh it's the, for the Jews no it's actually the Holy Land for the for all the a, a, a Abrahamic faiths it's Christianity terrible. Judaism it, it, and it's, Islam so. The, and, and the thing is, just to, just to clarify as well, cutting off water supply, cutting mm. off electricity is a war crime. <laughs> yeah. let, let, me yeah. read, let me read out a quote to you. Let me read out a quote to you. Um, Attacks against civilian infrastructure, especially electricity, are war crimes. Cutting off men, women, children of water, electricity and heating with winter coming, these are acts of pure terror. Initially, that was Ursula von der Leyen and the first country she used was Russia. So Russia's mm-hmm. attacks. So Ursula von der Leyen has said that that doing that is a war crime. Now, this this is what people need to understand. If you, th- th- this is what is commonly regarded as a war crime, but people have been whipped up into such a friend, f- frenzy and such disgust over Hamas, they are prepared to see what what amounts to a pogrom of these people, and that's just it's just not it's not acceptable. I, I, I don't want to see three million um, Israelis being treated like this. I don't want to see three million people in the Palestinian Gaza Strip being... I mean, it's everyone should be doing everything they can to try and de-escalate this. But people forget. There's people making a lot of money out of this. Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, all, all these military companies. And then there's other people getting a kick out of it. 
people need to just try and sit back and and try and de-escalate because that's what what civilized people do they don't yeah. rip each other's throats out and and yeah. drink their blood yeah yeah the 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 problem is that the the usually sensible talking heads in not only america but especially in britain they seem to have lost their heads and, and in fact <laughs> it's 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 shocking the extent to which it's happened because you've got people that you normally respected and you thought were just sensible and you were like following them on Twitter and uh, YouTube and stuff like that coming out um, with this uh, psychopathic bloodlust um, yep. Yep. to, to yep. basically level uh, parts of the Holy Land. Uh, and there's no good consequence from that for anybody in the long no. term. And you, no, people like you and I no. can see the long term and we always say, well, where is this going to lead? And as far as war Correct. in the Middle East is concerned, the only thing, the only thing that ever happens for Britain is tens and hundreds of thousands of refugees, not just going into Europe, but eventually coming to Britain. And that's the only thing that war in the Middle East has ever brought us or war in North Africa has ever brought us. And that's all that will ever bring us yep. if we get into yep. another major war with like, and what? if this escalates into Iran and so on, that's decades of millions of people leaving these areas to come to Britain. That's well, the only I, thing that will happen. So that's why we have to be speaking about how do we get peace? How do we get diplomacy? How do we keep a straight head in all of this? Well, I, I mean, it could. And, and the, 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 the thing I was saying is as well is what if you actually look at it and there's been a number of rabbis that I've, I've, I've quoted on this. The Israeli army have been left highly exposed. The notion of Israeli invincibility is gone now. And w what you have to realize is that they are fighting against people who have been brought up in what amounts to an open-air prison. These people are prepared to go and die. They're prepared to blow themselves up. Um, and, you know, that's that leaves us then, because this is the issue. People in the West are concerned about the rise and spread of Islam. They don't want to live in a caliphate. And, I mean, I, I, I can understand that. But I, I, what I'm trying to argue is that there has been a campaign by Zionist-funded organizations in the Western world to conflate the issues that people face with Islam in the West to the same issues that people face in, in Israel. And just to clarify, we put out earlier, Netanyahu funded and supported Hamas because he wanted Hamas to act as a bulwark against Fatah, which was the secular Arab bloc by um, Yasser Arafat. So I put up the quote in the article. They, they wanted to create a division between Gaza and the West Bank to attack the secular Fatah group. And it's backfired on them. Where did Al-Qaeda come from? People just think Al-Qaeda just popped out of nowhere. Al-Qaeda got their weapons and their missiles from the Americans when they were fighting against the, 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 um, the, the, the Mujahideen, were fighting against the Russians in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. If you give guns and weapons to these people, eventually they will be turned on you. And it, it, it was the same as well in Syria when Israel and the West supported the Nusra Front, which was basically ISIS because they didn't like Bashar al-Assad. So, again, this is what I'm just trying to say to people. You are being presented with a good and bad, good versus evil scenario. And what I'm trying to tell you is that's not really the tr That's not true because the Israelis have been to war with Syria, <laughs> the Ba'ath Party, when it was a pan-Arabist secular thing. So it's complicated. And again, people need to realize Hamas doesn't get on with Fatah. They don't like the PLO. Hamas is, is, is a Sunni militant organization. Hezbollah is a Shia militant organization. Iran is... This is it's complicated stuff, you know? And and this is where you just... Uh, 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 in my opinion, we can talk about it. We can debate about it. You can go out and protest. You can demonstrate about it. But under no circumstances should any British troops 
or any British weapons be donated or any military support given mm. to mm. any conflict that opens up in the Middle East. It is as, the, it is simple as that. Uh, that's right. I think people, uh, understandably, in our country, they're they're as we all are, distressed at the levels of mass immigration of into course. the country, which have been brought entirely upon ourselves by our politicians. Correct. And they, we are all horrified at the growth of what we generally regard as foreign cultures in our country, and we see the long-term dangers of that. And for some people, being gung-ho for Israel is like getting their own back on it the is. foreigners that they don't like. It is. In, it is. In, in Britain and it's I can understand how that kind of mentality totally. works and, and if I was much younger I would probably have believed that as well I, I would, and, I, and I, I, five, years, five years ago Alistair I would have been full on ultra Zionist I would have been I would have been saying all these things but I've been and, and, and I am still very sympathetic to the Jewish people I'm still very oh, sympathetic yeah. mm -hmm. to Israel but I have to put and I say to anyone who is a patriot or loves this country, we need to put our own country first. 100%. Um, because, as you point out, look at look at the state of it and mm. the, 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 the mass migration that, that, that exists and we shouldn't be getting... Because, look, this is the other thing people don't realise about mass immigration. People import their conflicts to us and we just have to have a ruthlessness like there's been this uproar of the israel flag being taken down and replaced by a palestinian flag as far as i can tell all i saw was two foreign flags flying over one of our town halls there should there should be one flag that flies if there is a single flagpole and that is the union flag if there is additional flagpoles it should be the flag of 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 the of the, the, the country within the United Kingdom. Yes, I've noticed our politicians, they, they love to virtue signal and make a big deal about supporting foreign countries before they'll support their own country. I mean, they'll far rather fly a foreign country's flag than fly the Union Jack half the time. Uh, I don't know why that is. Uh, I, yeah. think, I think it's just because it's easy to do and you don't have to you don't have to deal with the, the any fallout domestically um but there's right. certain there's certainly a tendency for them to do that and, and to fly and, off and, to foreign countries uh with while we've got problems right here in no, the united you, kingdom it's so correct it's so easier well let's they, they ukraine's fight is our fight israel no it's not our fight is for the heart and soul of this country and to return it to what it was and by which goodness, was that's hard that's a hard fight in itself. <laughs> well, that, that takes all and, for the, for those of us who care about those things. It takes our every waking moment to do. And that's but that's that's why they don't want to do it, Alistair, because fundamentally they do not have the best interests of this country at heart. Or this is it's just a job to them. They are they they are like they're a manager. That that's what it's like. It's like you're a manager of a a McDonald's franchise. Now, no offense, but you're just going to run it. Whereas if you're the owner, if that is your place, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna do whatever you can to protect it and survive it. That's just the way the world works. But yeah. we, we have this class of person, they just they don't care. Um they don't know our history, they don't know what this country was all about. And um we we, we need to fight for our survival. And um of course I mean, being blunt, we can sell these countries' weapons if they need them. That's the way the world's always worked, but we shouldn't be donating them. We shouldn't be really taking a stance on it. And No, especially when, it. it's, when all it's going to happen is it's going to end up in mass immigration into Europe <laughs> and, and Britain know. again. That's all it's going to come from. That's all it's ever come from wars in the Middle East for us. And that's all that will yeah. ever come from any of this. Yeah. And people can talk, oh, they should be crushed into the sea and all that kind of. That's just such, such, uh, just, that's just language. Because that, in reality, all you're doing is just causing death and destruction. And that's no good for anybody. No. And, 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 and that's, that, the, and the, that's the lie they told about the British Empire, because the British Empire didn't actually behave like that. Now, being an empire, being a, a colonial power, <clears throat> there was, there was a streak of discipline to that 
Mm. But that, but the, 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 this revisionism that we were these bloodthirsty people that went in and killed everybody, that's actually, it's not how it worked. And it, it was what made us a unique nation that, that we didn't just go in and execute everybody. And, and, and obviously there were incidents that happened, but, you know, it's, 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 it pales into insignificance when you look at the wars America have been involved in, the millions upon um, millions that have been killed as a result of American foreign intervention. Absolutely, David. I hadn't, it was such an interesting conversation about such a, a pertinent topic that I hadn't realised just how the time was, was, was shooting on there. So we'll, so we'll draw this to an end. But I, I do want to thank you for making us think about these things uh, and uh, to um, make us understand that there is always a third way in the sense that you don't have to you don't have to get driven along by the war propaganda, which is always intended, from whatever side it comes, is always intended to dehumanise the enemy with the prelude of extincting them, which is not to get back to the theme of faith, family and freedom and flag, well, is not a particularly Christian move. No. Um, and in that sense, Matthew chapter... Five, I think it is when Jesus says, "Blessed are the peacemakers." Peacemakers, correct? For and, they shall inherit uh, the earth. Um, th for they shall, for they are the children of God. I think is mm -hmm. the. Well, the well, you've got, you've caught me on my my, my <laughs> biblical quotes. Alistair, brilliant stuff. Thanks very much. Good. Good. Okay, David. Take care. Cheers. See you Bye later. Now. Bye bye. Um. So that's David Clues. That was an interesting conversation. Hope some of you found it. Uh, pertinent. Uh, sorry for people on TikTok who can't see the interview, but um, before I go, though, I do want to say one thing. Um, well, we have a winner. Um, let's talk about the winner. Now, the question that I asked was on this day in British history in 1982, a certain ship was raised from the Solent. What was the name of the ship? And the answer was the Mary Rose. And the winner is Ryan Lockwood. So, Ryan, fantastic. We'll be sending you our, this rather, Remembrance Day badge, which says, never forget, all gave some, some gave all. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. And we'll also send you a copy of our latest magazine. Now, Ryan, I don't know if we have your mailing address. If we don't, please send it to that email and we'll get that off to you tomorrow. Now, I also want to just, somebody asked, where do you get that badge? Now, that badge is available on our shop. Okay, let's put up the shop address here. It's our best seller. It says, a force for good through the middle of it. And a force for good is always an aspiration. Okay, it's not meaning to say, some people will say, oh, you know, you're not living up to it. Maybe we're not sometimes, but it's the aspiration. You have these ideas because you aspire to them. Um, yeah, it's an aspiration. It's not necessarily a, a reflection of what might be happening at the moment. A force for good is our aspiration. That's why, for example, we caution people not to get driven by war propaganda intended to dehumanize our fellow humans. Now, also what I want to encourage people to do is to sign up to our email list. And we'll put the email address up on the screen. Um, our email address is the way that we are able to directly get to you. Um, if we're not able to get to you uh, in any other way. And we've only got it there scrolling along the bottom. So what I'm going to do is create a banner. And it is a force for good.uk forward slash sign up. There we go a forceforgood.uk sign up. Folks, if you don't follow us on Facebook or Twitter or social media, or our, I'm going to start that again because what we're going to do, we'll clip this. 
folks, please sign up to our email updates, which come out every fortnight. If you don't sign up to our Facebook or our Instagram or our YouTube or our TikTok or our Substack, at least you can get our email, which is going directly into your inbox. And you can do that by going to our website, which is a forceforgood.uk forward slash sign hyphen up. We're really trying to get hundreds of new followers this year and to, to really have that as a good resource for our support and for everybody who believes in the United Kingdom and who believes in its in the aspiration that the United Kingdom can be a force for good. Please sign up, folks. Thank you. Let's have a quick look at the comments before we say goodbye. Derek Hart says, My grandfather said before I was born that World War Three would start in the Middle East. I do hope that he is... I do hope he's wrong. Ken says we need a strong union. Stuart likes the badge. Thank you for the compliment, Stuart. Susie says, well done to Ryan for winning, as does Derek. As does Catherine. Good stuff, folks. Okay, we will be... We will be back... We will be back next week. Please do tune in next week when we'll also have a guest. Susie says, thank you, Alistair and Chad. Good stuff, folks. It just remains for me to say, God bless the United Kingdom and God save the King. See you next week. <laughs>